Um, hi there, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining today. I am on with Max Rosencrantz, uh, who I recently met at an event um, at a place that I'm a member of a, a co-working space in Boulder. Um, and Max came and presented on a topic that was um, geared towards communication for entrepreneurs. And um, I really loved his talk and I absolutely thought that he should come on. And I think you guys are gonna get a lot of great value out of our conversation today. We're gonna talk about self-sabotage. Um, so Max, I'm gonna have you introduce yourself. And then also, I think we maybe need to come, come full circle and talk about the fact that your name is Maximum. And so I feel like kudos to your parents for that, but is there a story there? Um, yes, there's absolutely a story there. Thanks for having me, Terry. Uh, yeah, so my full name is Maximum. I mostly go by Max these days. Um, but my parents, so when my mom was pregnant with me and my parents were trying to figure out a name, uh, they had recently watched the BBC made for US market TV show Max Headroom yeah. about a guy who gets I've never watched it. Funny. <laughs> Every time I tell this story, I think I really should watch that show someday. <laughs> Uh, but a guy who, a TV reporter who gets stuck in his computer and his TV, and they said, oh, Max, that's definitely the name, uh, but it, it's missing something. They wanted it to have a little more punch to it, uh, and they came up with Maximum, and that's, that's the only story I've ever gotten beyond that. That's fantastic. It definitely has a lot of punch to it. That's for yeah. sure. <laughs> Great. So, yeah, tell us a little bit about, um, you know, who you are and what you do. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, who am I and what, I, what do I do? I'm a business coach uh, in terms of the professional context. And what that means for me is, um, and I'm a business coach and I focus on working with heart-centered entrepreneurs. And you were asking me in the intro, what, is that, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. um, for me, that means basically three things. Entrepreneurs who are first and foremost relationship focused, their businesses are about relationships, and relationships are a primary avenue through which they build their businesses. The second is, and this is closely related to the first, is communications are a primary area that they're growing in, that they're working on, and that they're leveraging in their business. And the third, and this one is becoming more and more important to me, is I really only work with people who are using business as a path for personal and spiritual growth. Mm -hmm. um, people who are in it for more than just the money, but are in it for the ways in which it puts us in contact with our inner worlds and the range of experience that life has to offer. So that's mm -hmm. what I mean when I say business coach for heart-centered entrepreneurs. Um, yeah, and outside of that, I'm, I'm a mountain man. I live in Boulder, Colorado. I'm super earthy. Uh, yeah, my background is mechanical engineering, so I have systems knowledge that I bring in and then I blend that with sort of the the more earthy spiritual stuff. Yeah, I love that. And what was it that made you want to really lean into specifically helping like, you know, heart-centered entrepreneurs? Because I, I do feel like that encompasses a, a pretty specific subset uh, mm -hmm. of people. So yeah, what made you lean into that? Yeah, well, I like to go deep. Um, that's where I like to live. Uh, and so I like to meet people in deep connection as we're doing this profound work around growing their businesses. Um, and if it's just the nuts and bolts of spreadsheets and systems and marketing tools, it gets a little dry for me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted that richer human connection for myself in the same way that my clients want it. Uh, so that's how I've narrowed down. Yeah, and I love that because I do think that you absolutely have to, in life, in all of life, seek out people who are also willing and open to that, right? Because there's yeah. a lot of a lot of folks who aren't, um, and then relationships and conversations and business can just stay somewhat superficial. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and a little bit flat. So I think that's really neat that you've done that. That's really great. I love it. Um, very cool. So I wanted to um, first jump into... There was a, a blog post that I saw on your website, and, and I like them because they're nice and concise. I always tell people I'm not much of a reader. I like magazines, though, because, because they're short, sweet, and to the point, and I can just, you know, flip through articles. And that's what your blog posts have really kind of felt like to me, but they're short and impactful. Um, mm. And there was one that I found that was, um, it was titled The Hidden Benefits of the Fixed Mindset. 
Um, mm. And I wrote down, I'm going to put on my glasses, because I wrote down a quote from it that I loved. And it says, thinking that you can't ever be good at something is another perfect strategy to conserve energy because it prevents you from taking action, which is expensive. And what's more expensive than taking action? Not taking action. In the long game, only those who take action in pursuit of development, learning, and advancement will reap the rewards. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that was like a really profound, I mean, that's just a, a little snippet of the article, but I just felt like that was really profound. And I think it comes back to something that you said um, when I first heard you speak, which, you know, you were talking about um, helping people um, entrepreneurs feeling comfortable about, you know, charging what they're worth for their services. And I feel like all of this is all kind of tied together as well, too. So yeah, I'm just wondering, um, yeah, let's just let's dig into this a little bit more. And how do you feel like that, that fixed mindset, like, if people, first of all, they have to recognize it, but then once they recognize it, you know, how do you start to talk about that with them? Mm, yeah, I love the question. Um, so the way I often think about this is that a fixed mindset is a consistent pattern, which doesn't take a bunch of executive thinking to implement. And the way I like to think about change is not that change is hard, but change requires energy. Mm -hmm. um, and we are, you know, as creatures, we're wired to conserve energy, to be efficient with our energy. Um, so by default, we're going to do whatever is easiest, whatever takes the least energy. When we want to make a change, um, we have to invest energy in shifting that pattern. And the fixed mindset um, basically cuts off all of those potential paths, all those potential change paths and says, no, 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 those are not possible, so don't waste any energy on them, mm -hmm. uh, which is great. Like, it's super effective. <laughs> the thing is, if you want a different outcome, you have to take different actions. So that's when I start to work with people is when they're like, all right, I've been doing the same thing for a long time, and I just can't take it any longer. Mm -hmm. um, I'm excited about the potential, um, or I'm frustrated about the current state of affairs, and that mobilizes enough energy to do the work to change the pattern. Mm -hmm. um, and as you start having successes in that process of change, uh, those pathways that you originally cut off as like, no, no, these can't happen, they start to open back up to you, mm -hmm. um, which is like, exciting and exhilarating and often quite scary. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Do you find when you're working with people that they can kind of do this slide where they can like slide into courage? And then if there's one little messed up, they can kind of slide right back. And do you feel like you have to kind of continuously sort of keep coming back to like re-evaluate what's happening as they try to move forward? Mm. So to the second question, yes, I think it's a continual evolution. It's a process of uh, re-evaluating and rechecking. But in terms of sliding into courage and sliding back, um, one, of the, one of the techniques that I share with people often and that I use myself that I love for this is I have a list of all of the difficult things that I've done in my life and especially in the last five years. And I read that every week and I remind mm -hmm. myself, oh, yeah, I do courageous things. Yeah, um, I have a strong warrior. And if I need to, uh, I can bring him out and we can do the scary things. Yeah, I love that. I love that. That's really great. Um, I know that one of the things that I tend to work with people on also is sort of like proactively seeing ahead what mm. what could be getting in my what what might come up that's going to get in my way right mm. and I know that with finances it's so closely correlated to um, like health and and weight loss and all those there's so many like analogous like components to all of that too but it's just like you know if you're trying to do better with your diet and you still drive by that same Dunkin Donuts every single morning on the way to work and it makes you well then you're gonna have to maybe drive a different way to work right so yeah. I think there's something to be said for also kind of like circumventing those things in advance as well so but that's really cool writing down all the courageous things that you've done I really love that yeah that's great so um, what I wanted to talk about with you today, we kind of hit on this in one of our previous conversations about um, self-sabotage. Yeah. And um, I think that what I would really like to kind of dig into is um, when, when it's really like a subconscious mm -hmm. act, right? And people mm -hmm. maybe don't realize that they're doing it. Um, yeah, I, 
I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts as far as like, you know, how does that tend to show up for people, you know, when you're working with clients anyway, what do you see? Mm, yeah. So usually what it looks like is the client starts to make a lot of progress or they have a big win in one or multiple areas of their life. And then the next time we talk, oh, there's been this, this big travesty and something went off the rails. So maybe they had a big financial win, they booked a new client, um, or they got a new engagement that they're going to work on, they're excited about, and then something happens with their health. Uh, my shoulder's hurting and I can't work today, something like that. Um, or they just go back down into the spiral of negativity. Um, so it, it pretty much always happens, self-sabotage, in my experience, pretty much always happens on the heels of something going well. Mm -hmm. um, and the way I like to think about it, and the reframe that I would offer to everyone is self-sabotage is actually a protective mechanism that our system has in place to prevent us from getting hurt. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not a very useful one most of the time in our current culture and society. And um, so the way I often think about it is our capacity to feel good is like a muscle. When you go to the gym, I did a talk on this at Ignite Denver. Um, our capacity to feel good is a skill or a muscle that we have to build. And if we lift something heavier than we have the muscle for, if we have a good experience beyond what our nervous system and our bodies have the capacity to feel good for, a little alarm bell kicks in and says, screw something up because this is too heavy for me. Hmm. And the trick is, rather than getting wrapped up in understanding, oh, why am I self-sabotaging? What's, you know, what's my unconscious story around this? Is just noticing, oh, this thing feels heavy, meaning good, uh, and practice being with that. Mm -hmm. Most of us don't have a lot of practice being with really good feelings, which is probably something I'm very, it's something I'm very sad about and very excited about because there's so much opportunity. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I think that's really interesting. The, the first um, example that you gave was, you know, kind of talking about something good happening and then these other things just kind of uh, tend to show up and, and you mentioned specifically like body pain, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I'm wondering if, if you feel like sometimes the manifestations are, I don't know, for some reason, I almost want to say obscure, but you know, are they like obscure enough that it's hard for people to correlate and see what's happening? Yes. Um, yes. And so typically the linking, the linkage between the thing, you know, the good thing that happened and the negative thing that happened is way under the hood for most people. Um, unless you're like a hardcore yogi and a hardcore meditator and you like really track every little detail. For most people, it's like I do one thing and then three days later, this other thing happens and I have no idea how they're correlated. Mm -hmm. And the good news is that it doesn't matter so much how they're correlated. If we start to view those negative things popping up simply as a sign that we're moving in the right direction mm -hmm. and we refocus on feeling good, uh, we can skip kind of skip the Sherlock Holmes phase. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, do you have um, recommendations for how people can start to kind of take note of all these different things happening for them to them, both good and bad? Mm, yeah. Uh, so many recommendations. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't already have a mindfulness practice, this is to everyone in the audience, highly recommend that. I started with two minutes a day. My commitment was I'll do two minutes in the morning every day, no excuses. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's pretty hard to talk myself out of two minutes. And I work my way over from there, from two to five to 10. I usually do like 15 minutes a day right now. That's what I find most useful. Mm -hmm. But that's going to be, that's going to help train your body awareness and train your awareness of your thoughts um, and train your capacity to just notice what's happening. Uh, so that's that's sort of the, the most fundamental of all the practices. Mm -hmm. And then a resource that I would point people to that I love for this is a book called The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks. Yeah. Um, and I love that book because it's talking entirely about self-sabotage, but he calls it by a different name and a, a more useful name in my experience. He calls it The Upper Limit. Yes. Um, yeah. So those are two things that people can go after. 
Yeah, I love that. Um, and so I feel like we've kind of talked about how these things can kind of show up more unconsciously, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering how often do you see people really like intentionally self-sabotaging and, and how, how that looks different? Mm. Yeah, so when it's more intentional or more conscious, uh, that I tend to find has to do with what their belief systems are. Mm -hmm. um, so like a classic one is if someone is believing the thought, if people put their attention on me, it's dangerous or I'm going to get hurt, mm. they're not going to put themselves out there. Mm -hmm. Or if someone is believing the thought, I'm not worthy of success or I'm not good enough, uh, they'll struggle to be confident in a sales pitch. Mm -hmm. And often when I'm working with a client and they're feeling that, uh, they'll, after the fact, they'll say, oh, but I am, but I'm not good enough. Mm. Um, and they, they're still believing. As long as they continue to believe that thought, they're going to take actions, conscious or unconscious, to kind of wreck the proposal somehow. Mm. Um, yeah. Well, that's really interesting. Yep. That's interesting. I, I mean, because I know that I see these things play out um, in in similar and also in different ways, you know, financially speaking, um, uh, you know, if people feel like people, if they've heard messages, right? So it's mm -hmm. deeply rooted in their belief system. That, you know, people with money are are greedy or are bad or money is bad or, you know, any of those kind of things. And, and even though these people may really, really, really want to obtain more money, they still have ways of just like giving it away, right? And and not mm -hmm. like in the most charitable way. It's just like, let me just spend it and get rid of it and then I won't have it. And it's like kind of that kind of constant pursuit, right? Of, of chasing something and then just, again, it's the self-sabotage of like getting rid of what you work so hard for also. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, okay, uh, what was one of the other things that I wanted to ask you to um oh when when i saw you at the talk also um i feel like one of the conversations um that you brought up was if people didn't feel and this is really speaking to entrepreneurs um or business owners you know however it is um if they don't necessarily feel worthy of you know charging certain rates or anything like that and and i know you just touched on that as far as like having that as kind of like a belief system um but how how hard do you find that to be when you're really working with people to, um, you know, not only like change that mindset, but to also identify where it came from to begin with? Mm. So the first question, how hard is it to change? Uh, that question, I'm going to give a little bit of a non-answer, but mm -hmm. bear with me. Uh, when the person is ready to change, when they're really wanting a change, when they're, they've accepted that, oh, it's like this, and I see it for what it is, mm -hmm. it tends to be pretty easy, actually. Um, there are two techniques that I use that I found are really effective. Um, one is the Byron Katie method, and one is the Lefko method. Those are two limiting belief processes. You can look them up online, you can do them for free, or you can call me if you want support. Yeah. Um, but when the person is ready to change and they see it for what it is, those processes will help identify where did the belief come from how is the belief actually not true? How is it showing up in their lives? And what's the impact it's having? And then how do they basically unsee it? Mm. How do they uninstall it? If we think of our brains as a, a computer and we install pieces of software called I'm not good enough or I'm not worthy of success or money is bad, um, you can uninstall those programs and write new ones. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, and then I think there was a second part of the question that I don't remember it. Uh, there was, I don't remember it either. I should write Sorry, it down, but I, I, <laughs> no, but I think that was helpful. Um, yes. So you do still work with clients one-on-one. -on -one. Um, yeah. So tell us, uh, you know, if you tell us a little bit more about, you know, uh, how people, you know, how can they work with you? What is it like for them to get in touch with you? And, and, you know, do you see folks on a long-term basis? What is it like to work with you? Yeah, uh, I'll start at the end there. I work with people exclusively on a long-term basis. Uh, as I said at the beginning, I'm all about building relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and what I found is that giving ourselves a long-term container, I'm usually working with people for six to nine months. 
um, that gives us the space to really make some rapid and radical transformations. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, for the time being, I'm still doing one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I'll be shifting more and more to group uh, and online programs. So uh, yeah, just because I want to want to scale and touch more lives, help more people. Um, but yeah, if someone is at a point in their business where um, they have skill in working in the business, you know, whatever their chosen field is, they're pretty skilled at that, yeah. but they're struggling to translate that into, okay, what the heck is marketing? How do I sell in a way that feels good to me? How do I communicate with my clients in more effective ways so that I'm not so overwhelmed all the time? Um, and how do I grow? Uh, whether that means growing revenues or hiring a team. Um, a lot of my clients come to me when they're in the process of hiring a bigger team. So mm -hmm. that's something I love helping people with because you you run up a, a up against a bunch of uh, bumps and and upper limits when you start hiring people. Um, yeah. yeah, that's uh that's the time for someone to seek me out. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that because those those all sound very much like the tactical part that I'm sure your engineering background has come into play on as well, which is really great. But yes, isn't that the truth? It's like I think that as a business owner, like once you start committing to paying somebody else's paycheck and impacting their livelihood, your decision making process and all that too really can shift again, right? Of it's not just about me now; it's about somebody else. And so that is a really interesting place for growth, I think, for a lot of people. Um, I do always feel like it's so good to lean into if people can get behind this and embrace that failure is just feedback, right? right. If they can just learn that and embrace that. Um, I know that as an entrepreneur, there's all kinds of things that like I do, I put myself out there. And I feel like I don't really look at much anything as like a failure. I just look at it as there that's feedback right something about that didn't work or something about uh, about this process could probably be better or different or changed or something and so i think that um yeah being able to embrace that is where you can really lean in and do a lot of growing um i've said this recently before too that i actually have um a little sticky note that's like in my closet where I get dressed every day that it just says every day is a lesson. And I think it's just so important to just look at every single opportunity that you have every, you know, juncture that some sort of decision point to is just really understanding like, there's something here for me that maybe I need to look a little deeper, but kind of figure out what this is about. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's really great. Well, Max, it has been such a pleasure to talk with you today. Tell people where they can go um, learn more about you because I know one of the things I asked you when we last met, I said, are you really on social media? Because I couldn't find you anywhere. So, I mean, that's kind of cool. But yeah, tell people if they're interested in learning more about you, where can they go? Yeah, so the main place is my website, coachmaximum.com. Uh, and you're not wrong. I'm not on so social media all that much. Uh, starting to be more. I, I'm an old man, even if I look somewhat young. <laughs> um, so on YouTube, you can find me at Coach Maximum. Uh, on Instagram, you can find me at Coach Maximum as well. Cool. So, yeah, uh, looking forward to connecting. Uh, that's wonderful. Great. Thank you so, so much. It is always a pleasure to talk with you, and hopefully we'll be able to chat again soon. Yeah, thanks for having me, Terry. You bet. Thank you. I hope that you enjoyed that as much as I. I'd love to know, did you learn anything new or unexpected? If you enjoyed this topic and want to see others like it, you can always check out this playlist as well. All right, I will see you next time. Take care.